Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest today. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Professor Ibrahim Abubakar, who is the Dean at University College London Faculty of Population Health Sciences, a professor of infectious disease epidemiology, and previously served as director of University College London's Institute for Global Health. Um, Professor Bukhar was appointed uh, National Institutes of Health and Care Research Senior Investigator in 2017, elected to the fellow as a fellow Academy of Medical Sciences in 2020, uh, and led University College London Center for Infectious Disease and Epidemiology. Uh, their tuberculosis program was also a senior investigator uh, at the Medical Research Council Clinical Trials Unit. Uh, he's also served as head of tuberculosis at uh, Public Health England, and prior to uh, his appointment at UCL, uh, was professor in uh, health protection at the uh, Norwich Medical School. Uh, professor Bubakar qualified in medicine uh, in 1992, initially trained in general medicine uh, before specializing in public health. Uh, his academic public health training was undertaken at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, University of Cambridge, and the University of East Anglia. Uh, and Professor Bubakar is a member of the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, uh, chair of Lancet Migration, a global collaboration to uh, help advance migration health, uh, Lancet Nigeria Commission, and the uh, National Institute for Health and, and Care Research uh, Global Health Professorship Committee. Uh, he's also served as the chair of the World Health Organization Strategic and Technical Advisory Group for Tuberculosis, uh, as well as of the Wellcome Trust Expert Review Group on Population Health. Uh, a lot of uh, very interesting themes to get into today. We're honored to have him. Uh, Professor Ibrahim Abubakar, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule. To come talk to us for a little while. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Wonderful having you. Um, a lot, again, very important themes to get into today. Um, would love to start things out, though, uh, as we typically do, by by handing you the floor for a little bit. <clears throat> One, to talk about yourself, just to, to further introduce you to our audience, um, <clears throat> a little bit about your background, the development of your your intellectual interest in medicine and public health. And, you know, uh, I, I very much enjoy taking a look at the uh, the sort of the dissertations uh, of our guest. And I found yours uh, completely uh, remarkable in the sense that, um, if I may read the title of it, uh, An Epidemiological Investigation of the Role of Mycobacterium avium Subspecies Parabdoriculosis in the Etiology of Crohn's Disease. And I have to say, um, your dissertation brought together so many themes that we have touched on on our show in terms of public health, animal health, one health, uh, the whole area of infectious diseases uh, impacting sort of uh, non-communicable diseases. Would love for you to take us a little into the history of this as well, because I think it it feeds uh, not just into those important themes, but everything we're going to be touching on a little later in the episode. Excellent. Thank you. So I suppose I should go back to the beginning. I was born in Nigeria, in sub-Saharan Africa, um, and a lot of my aspirations and how I view global health um, has its beginnings and origins in uh, the early parts of my life, um, looking at the society that I was born into um, and the huge disparities between those that have and those that don't and the inequality therein and the needless loss of life associated with um, inequalities and infections in particular that exact an outsized toll on people. So eventually um, I ended up studying medicine. I qualified as a doctor and 
subsequently trained further um, in general medicine and infectious diseases, um, and then uh, specialized um, um, at a number of institutions in the UK, um, postgraduate specialism in public health. Um, as part of that, I did the PhD you alluded to, and um, the motivations for that as a public health person with an interest in both inequalities as well as infections is to find a condition where perhaps um, there is a link between chronic diseases and um, acute infections, uh, right? And there were a number of hypotheses in the, that era that, um, in fact, lots of chronic diseases are driven by um, underlying infectious diseases. So my thesis essentially conducted a national case control study looking at uh, patients in multiple hospitals distributed across England um, that had Crohn's disease and community controls. And we used a variety of methods ranging from data on animals and how much um, they are, those animals are excreting mycobacterium paratuberculosis in the environment, all the way to water systems and people's water supply, and ultimately collection of clinical information on the cases and the controls about their risk factors and a range of things from diet. Uh, to other exposures that may explain Crohn, Crohn's disease. And then we undertook epidemiological analysis and published a range of papers that found some interesting associations. Um, at the ecological level, there were very clear associations with paratuberculosis. But actually, when you do individual level case control analysis, that association was not proven. However, we found other exposures in the environment, such as excessive um, intake of red meats and other dietary exposures that had more powerful associations. Uh, nevertheless, uh, that rekindled my interest in a disease that clinically had been um, a passion of mine, uh, which is uh, tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And based on that PhD, I got into the wider field of other mycobacteria and mycobacterium tuberculosis complex itself and developed a research career in TB uh, um, and TB epidemiology. Mm -hmm. And, you know, along the way, um, uh, another Again, fascinating paper that I ran into of yours. This one was in the um, the British Medical Bulletin in uh, June of 2016, uh, entitled uh, "Repurposing Drugs for the Treatment of Tuberculosis: A Role for Nonsteroidal uh, Anti-Inflammatory Drugs." And again, here uh, the the theme of repurposing. Um, in both infectious diseases, of course, the last couple of years, but um, in all sorts of diseases has become so hot. Um, again, in this particular case, you're dealing uh, with tubercular, traditional tuberculosis um, and, and thinking about, okay, uh, we need, as you point out, in an era where we have not been developing a pharmaco therapeutic armamentarium uh, for this condition or at the rate that we sh probably should be, um, what are some of the strategies to combat uh, not just the disease, but uh, potentially antibiotic resistance and all the other uh, you know, components of, uh, of this condition? Talk a little bit about 2016, um, the work you were doing here, because repurposing, as I mentioned, is you know now eight years later, an extremely hot theme on all fronts. So um, I suppose it isn't rocket science. Um, anybody that is aware of the way pharmacology and availability of new medicines and uh, how we have over the last couple of decades made with every single intervention to protect us from inadvertent misuse of um, pharm pharmacological agents, we've made it harder and harder to get mm -hmm. new compounds um, licensed. Uh, therefore, ultimately, if you think about the thousands and thousands of compounds that are already licensed, and the fact that their, their use may not be um, restricted to the condition that either the FDA, the EMA, or the uh, relevant regulatory uh, authorities in the various um, end countries of licensed medicines, that there are alternative uses for these medicines. It's really not hard to see that the opportunities are immense, right, to mm -hmm. repurpose medicines and use them on new conditions. And we are every day discovering new uses for existing medicines. It's therefore not surprising for a condition like TB, where prior to the last couple of decades, there was nearly, um, um, well, over 50 years of um, a death of any new medical compounds. So prior to the arrival of uh, bedaquiline and delamine, the, the, the newer agents that are now used to treat multidrug resistant TB, there was really very little new compounds um, in the TB um, armory to, to, to fight this devastating bug that continues to kill millions um, globally. Consequently, um, our group and others around the world thought, um, what else could you do? And in TB in particular, uh, the idea that um, suppressing or tinkering with the immune system 
may have a role. It's not really that new. So in TB meningitis, when it affects the central nervous system, um, randomized control trials have already demonstrated, and it's indeed part of treatment, uh, the current uh, standards for treatment, to use some level of um, tinkering with the immune system using steroids to mitigate against the inflammatory effects um, right. of, of the, the TB has. So extending that um, and looking at other agents that are immunomodulatory, including steroids, was um, a logical step. Um, and consequently, I'm delighted to say others are doing that necessary trials. But innovation and looking at um, TB from a different lens and approach and different um, approaches to manage TB is something that um, in that phase of my career, I was passionate about. So contributing to the work of the MRC Clinical Trials Unit then when I was a senior investigator and really important trials that were being run by that unit, including in particular, one led by my colleague in Singapore, Nick Payton, uh, called the Trunquet trial that radically attempted to look at, could we shorten the treatment down to two months by using more agents and accepting a certain proportion of failure rates, uh, including treatments that attempted to shorten the duration of drug-resistant TB treatment. Um, I'm, I'm thinking here, the STREAM trial, which was conducted by the MRC Clinical Trials Unit that I contributed to. So this uh, paper that you cited, is part of a series of activity that attempted to improve the treatment of TB. And I'm delighted to say some of those trials have been completed and they've influenced global standards for the management of those conditions and that we do things different, differently now because we've done those studies. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so you know, again, moving now, uh, again, a little bit forward in, in, in the TB theme, and I really appreciate you spending all time on this because it is such a, a critical issue. Um, you participated in the um, uh, 2023 UN high-level meeting on tuberculosis. <clears throat> You've written a series of papers, uh, one uh, just a couple months ago in, in Lancet Respiratory Medicine, uh, talking about the high-level meeting and um, sort of the situation where we are uh, in terms of, you know, <laughs> We've made some progress. Unfortunately, though, it, tuberculosis has reclaimed this position uh, from COVID uh, as this world's number one infectious killer. Um, I was wondering if you could just take us through a, a little bit of what you've experienced per the high-level meeting at the United Nations where we are in 2024 with regard to uh, next steps. And, and then, you know, I, I also found it quite interesting. You, you published another paper in Lancet Respiratory Medicine recently, too, um, talking about, you know, at the time, COVID-19 being a scapegoat for a lack of progress in tuberculosis, although, you know, clearly uh, very different conditions and, you know, different situations. Um, to, to, to take a little bit about sort of what you've also experienced in what we've gone through the last couple of years and how that's affected uh, some of our progress as well. So my involvement in global TB policy actually goes back to contributions to the work of the World Health Organization on TB for um, over the last decade and a half. Um, and after contributing to the formulation of multiple guidelines in different aspects of TB, they asked me to chair the main TB advisory group for the WHO called uh, the Stag TB. Um, and um, as part of that rule, um, we, together with the leadership of the WHO TB program, helped put together the um, first um, high-level meeting on TB uh, in New York, which was in 2018. And that actually was um, the precursor to the more recent meeting that you cited. And that meeting was superbly exciting because it was, it was on a trajectory of progress. TB rates globally were declining. Treatment rates were improving. And we were doing better and better, both in terms of investment in research and in our ability to do well in TB. Uh, it was an exciting time. Um, interestingly, the political commitment then, while not perfect, was also good. I was at the meeting in New York. In fact, I spoke um, at the UN high-level meeting um, in 2018, and we had a number of heads of states in attendance in, at the meeting, and they bought into the program, and implementation to accelerate that progress started. Sadly, as we all know, COVID hit us in 2020, and um, typical of uh, what happens uh, with TB, which uh, Lee Reichman um, from New Jersey describes as this as a cycle of neglect and as happened in New York with the disinvestment in TB control. Our um, neglect of TB during the pandemic and looking the other way has meant that sadly uh, TB rates re-emerged. Um, we had a lot more transmission and mortality rates 
consequently have increased and our efforts to essentially accelerate the uh, progress towards ultimately eliminating TB has been set back considerably. So the global data now suggests that because of the pandemic, uh, we are where we are, which is um, not really optimal. So this meeting took place then in that context where following some progress, we have had a significant setback. And disappointingly, compared to the 2018 meeting, there are far fewer heads of states in attendance. Um, mm -hmm. There were political representatives at the meeting, but the level of political traction that the TV community attended, a, attracted was disappointing. And I'd like to call out the leadership, especially of the countries with large burdens of TB, i.e. the middle-income countries that have the largest number of countries, that they should take um, more responsibility and contribute to global leadership in both TB research, but also TB control. I'm obviously not suggesting that there isn't a place uh, for the UK, for the US and the major health economies to continue contributing. TB affects us all. And until we get rid of it everywhere, a bit like COVID, it may come back to haunt us. Therefore, it's important we all contribute, but there's a particular role for those countries. The positive from that high-level meeting is that actually, if you look at the text of the declaration, countries remarkably were more concrete in their commitments and in the metrics they lay out in terms of what they want to achieve with TB control going forward. So what I now do is to say, given that there is now agreement on what needs to be done, we need to get on and do it. So moving on to um, the broader theme of preparedness, as I mentioned in the bio, you um, are a member of the, the board of the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board. Um, it, uh, it's an independent agency, you know, co-convened by uh, both the World Health Organization and the World Bank. And, you know, you put together a, um, again, a quite uh, esteemed group, uh, a very diverse range of specialties, obviously these uh, emergencies, these public health emergencies are a lot more than public health. You have veterinary uh, epidemiologists and environmental people, uh, people that think about the economics and the law. I mean, uh, everything that we've learned, um, obviously, uh, this goes back a couple of years to, you know, pre-COVID and, you know, in, in the sense of the time of Ebola crises and so forth, but really thinking about what all the capabilities are that need to come together to uh, ensure proper preparedness for these global health emergencies. Talk a little bit, if you would, about the history of the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board and, and a little bit about your e election to, to the board and serve, uh, obviously, in a very, very critical role with your with your set of expertise. Yeah. So I, I was um, honored when the World Health Organization and uh, the World Bank invited me to join the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board. And as you say, this is a very eminent group of experts. I only joined in 2002, but I was already acutely aware of the influential annual reports that the board publishes. Almost really salient and timely reports. The timing was um, remarkable, really. The first set of reports just before the pandemic outlined that the world is at risk. The next set of reports um, outlined how the world was coping with the pandemic and uh, the consequent sort of disarray in our response mm -hmm. and ultimately leading to our most recent report. So it was a group of experts that kind of got it right, got all of the points to inform the world about what the world needed to do. The primary purpose of this diverse group of world experts that the, the WHO and the World Bank has put together and purposely so to have uh, diverse disciplines because our response needs to be informed by those disciplines is to serve as an independent monitoring body yeah. to enable the world to know what we are doing well and what we are not doing well so that we can ask for accountability. To use all of that material and evidence generated to advocate um, for our political leaders and society as a whole, accountable to society to say whether we are doing well, areas that we are not doing well, and make sure that we know what the risks are, what our vulnerabilities are, how prepared we are uh, for the next major threat um, and call everybody to prioritize what needs to be done to meet the gaps um, and to do so with a sense of urgency that the world needs if we are not to find ourselves um, in a state where we are unprepared again. Um, and sadly, our report concludes uh, using very independent objective metrics that the world is not prepared for the next threat. One of the 
um, the issues that you know you, you have, um, as you mentioned, the, there's the importance of independent monitoring, um, you know, and then a component of of this is is the principle of global preparedness. And one of the things you point out in the materials uh, is that um, global preparedness is not adding up all national preparedness. So Nigeria is prepared, Ghana is prepared. Uh, no, it's, when you put it all together, that doesn't mean that the world is prepared. And I, I think this is a very important piece of this. Explain the principle of global preparedness compared to sort of the central focus, which has been, you know, unfortunately, one way or another, uh, hey, preparedness at the national level only. Uh, take us into that theme. I think it's an extremely important part of this. Right. So there is one global community. It isn't um, the pathogens don't organize themselves into nation states, right, and fight each other. They right. they, they attack us. Um, consequently, the way to think about monitoring and preparedness is yes, absolutely, we must look at those units and the countries and governments as to whether they've done their preparedness efforts. But the fora at the regional level, the fora at the uh, global level, the UN agencies that cross coordinate between countries, civil society that underpin national level preparedness and sometimes have reach across national boundaries. Private sector and the private sector is probably, um, especially for those of us that live in economies that where the private sector has a significant role, are um, aware that if a large proportion of the economy and everything we do is driven by what happens in private sector, to exclude that in preparedness is just bunkers. It's absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. Therefore, for me, preparedness is about all of the things I said, um, having the right metrics, identifying the risks and vulnerabilities, getting, making sure that all of those parties that I've listed and not just national governments have got the tools necessary um, and have got the preparedness to respond to the next um, pandemic. And we um, on the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board are there to produce those evidence-based reports for all of those sectors. This is where we are, and then use that to advocate for political change um, and for policy change um, to ensure that um, the right measures are being put in place to prepare the world. And, and you know, you, you um, as you were saying, the re the report card uh, on, on global preparedness wasn't the best, and and you lay out uh, several key findings in in, in the report uh, where we could uh, where we have weaknesses, what we need to improve. I, I was wondering if you could say a couple words about a few of these. I mean, clearly. Um, the global financing system, uh, I mean, you know, we've seen the you know, things like the the World Bank's uh, uh, Pandemic Preparedness Fund. Um, the global financing system for pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response clearly needs more <laughs> to to be expanded. And, and there's a lot of pieces that go into that. Again, that's a financing beyond just health financing. We wonder if you say if you've read that. And then also um, the topic of equitable and robust R and D and supply chains. Um, again, we saw the weaknesses to this the last couple of years. I wonder if you could talk, so let's talk about that because these are two uh, major weaknesses, I'll just say <laughs> within the list of weaknesses. And I wonder if you could talk through some of your, your views on these topics. Sure. So firstly, I think I'd like to start by reiterating our main conclusion, which is essentially the world is falling behind, right? Yeah. There is no doubt about it. When you look at the proportion of, um, in our metric and, and um, the fra evidence-based framework that we've developed. Mm -hmm. It's very clear that in a whole range of areas, the world made great progress during COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of incredible global laboratory capacity. In the most remote places, you had PCR tests that could yep. detect COVID. The world also mobilized communities because the whole of society was affected. And that's what pandemics do. They affect the whole of society. Therefore, it's incredibly disappointing that... Um, uh, shortly after the pandemic, in a very typical human fashion, because we want to forget about bad experiences, we very swiftly moved to essentially disinvesting in many of these areas. So rather than actually making progress, we've taken a step back in terms of the amount of investment and financial commitment. I must congratulate and um, acknowledge positively the creation of the pandemic fund, but it is nowhere near adequate. Even in the simple need for research and development, for preparedness for future uh, uh, pandemics. The pandemic fund is a tiny, tiny fraction of what um, the, the the planet requires, uh, our humanity requires to get ready for the next pandemic. Therefore, the order of magnitude in terms of financing that we need, but not just commitments to money, but actually realizing those monies and our ability to dispense those funds and utilize them, whether it is in R&D or strengthening 
public health programs at the national, regional, and um, cross-national level. All of those have, uh, um, need um, essentially further uh, strengthening um, and um, urgent action to 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 um, make sure we have a sustained and um, level of preparedness that improves capacity and capability, including for the most vulnerable um, that are often neglected in society. Um, we also highlight in the report, um, and I'd like to draw out this because it's a really important issue, the issue of trust and deficit in trust, partly as a consequence of the pandemic and the uh, degree of misinformation that um, wasn't geopolitical divisions and um, created inequities in the system. And people became um, even less trusting of authority and our systems. If we are to be ready for the next pandemic, we need to think through how we are interconnected as humans um, how we are reliant on each other and try to rebuild that trust in public health systems, in research and authority, um, so that when the next pandemic hits us, we are not a divided global community, but we're able to organize in such a way that perhaps we contain it before it spreads globally. And if it does spread globally, that each country and each corner of the planet can respond adequately, taking all stakeholders on board, whether it is civil society or the private sector. And I repeat the private sector point, because um, a large chunk of the global response needs to include um, our individuals that are not part of government and the state. And we need mm -hmm. to maximally utilize the potential that the private sector has to make a difference. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's always shocking to me to, to see. I mean, we, we've we touched on this a bit on previous shows in terms of, you know, we dealt with Ebola and then we quickly forgot about Ebola. Um, even though I have an ambassador Nakanga song on, you know, talking about PEPFAR a couple months ago and here, you know, here's a case where we, we took a death sentence and made it, you know, almost a curable condition over the last 40 years. And we just forget about the need of some of these programs. And um, I just, yeah, again, um, yeah, I think what you're highlighting is extremely important and that we, uh, we can't keep having this amnesia, let's call it. And um, please. It's a very human coping mechanism, right? To yeah. kind of put back bad, me bad memory um, as far as possible into our minds. And I see why we do that, which is to cope with yeah. um, and move on and, and innovate. But we do so at our own peril in this case, because there will be another, sadly, there will be another pandemic. Um, we hope it's not in our lifetime, but there will be another one. So the yeah. thing we must do is to prepare for the next one and as much as possible to make sure every part of the global health system is ready. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we talked about some of the other um, areas that you're involved in, Professor. I, I mentioned in, um, you know, clearly in addition to your uh, your your expertise in infectious diseases, tuberculosis, um, you know, preparedness, um, you're involved in in various other areas, and I and I thought that um, we could touch on, um, for instance, uh, the the Lancet Nigeria Commission, which, um, you know, again, you've you spent time. Um, on, on this specific commission, you've written about sort of um, uh, the one piece was uh, investing in health and future of the nation. Uh, and it was interesting. I um, a couple of years ago, I was on a, uh, a World Economic Forum um, uh, committee with uh, Muhammad Ali Pate, now Nigeria's uh, coordinating minister of health and, and social welfare. Uh, Nigeria is fascinating, right? I mean, it's it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful microcosm of sort of everything we were just talking about in the sense, you know, large population, uh, extreme wealth in, in certain areas, extreme, uh, you know, uh, the poorness, um, uh, many ethnic groups, um, a very diverse economy. Talk about some of the, the issues that you work on on the Nigeria Commission per the Lancet uh, initiative? Because, I again, it, it looks like a, an amazing, um, again, microcosm of everything else that we've just been talking about. Um, what, what types of things are you uh, looking at in terms of, um, again, um, resources, um, the uh, abundance of, of, uh, of human capital, uh, all sorts of these initiatives to sort of improve the, uh, the health system and, and the future of, uh, of Nigeria as a nation. So fascinating that you mentioned um, Dr. Mohamed Ali Pati, um, because mm -hmm. he was one of our commissioners on the Lancet Nigeria yep. Commission. I convened uh, a group of um, Nigerians, eminent Nigerians within the country and in the diaspora with um, academic roles in major uh, top universities um, here in Europe, in 
Australia, the, 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 the US, as well as within Nigeria and the rest of the African continent. And we spent two years putting together all of that evidence and new analysis, collaborating with others that have access to data such as um, the Institute of Health Metrics in Seattle to get um, sort of the global burden of disease type data, but also compare Nigeria with other West African states. Mm-hmm. And I would say, um, if I was to say to Dr. Pate now, and um, in, as he Im- implements um, his ambitious program of reform in, within Nigeria, that our report from the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, sorry to take you back a little bit to the previous topic, is a perfect yeah. example of um, areas and issues you should deal with. So almost all of our key items in the 2023 report, whether it is in fact investing in preparedness or creating surplus capacity to make sure that this, um, if and when a pandemic hits, the routine health system can step up and respond, or dealing with trust, as we were discussing, yeah. or creating manufacturing capacity so that Nigeria is not reliant on having to import all of the products, whether it's medicines or diagnostics, or indeed having a system that is aligned and more effective in meeting equitably the needs of the poorest people in the slums of Lagos and Kano, as well as the elites in those cities, um, and creating the evidence base and knowledge. All of those things are appropriate for Nigeria. Not surprisingly, you'd, you'd, uh, you'd, you'd not be surprised to hear that our report, also the Nigeria Commission, addresses all of these issues. To increase the capacity of the health system requires that you address a whole range of health system level issues. But my proudest element of producing that report was the fact that not long after we published the report, the Nigerian government, because we worked closely with policymakers, took the findings of the report and went ahead and passed a law um, to reform the national health insurance scheme Mm -hmm. um, to improve coverage for the most vulnerable Nigerians and with an ambition that they create a fund to provide health insurance to 83 million poorest Nigerians. I was absolutely delighted when the president announced that and the law was that a new law was passed to do that. Party now has the unenviable task of actually delivering on this massive reform program and is incredibly focused on increasing health coverage in ensuring investment in the health sector so that there's adequate manufacturing on improving research and productivity of um, the system and the health workforce, um, things that I all agree with. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing how that translates into massive health gain. Excellent. And um, moving on, I mean, you're, as I said at the beginning, you're involved in a lot of very difficult issues. Um, I want to add this one into the, the mix. Um, you know, again, as we've been talking about uh, a world that uh, is not ready, um, where we need to do better with preparedness um, f- for all future public uh, emergencies. Um, now add in one other factor, because you are on the Lancet Commission for Migration and Health, Um we got about one eighth of the population of the planet that is on the moves. Um, uh, this is a reality. Uh, it is a, a global health issue. It's a political issue. It's all <laughs> a lot of a lot of issues come together with this one. I would love if you could just say a few words while we have you on what you're discussing currently in 2024, or thinking about per the Lancet Migration Commission uh, and this very critical issue of uh, of migration as part of the global uh, public health uh, story. So the Lancet Commission on Migration and Health, uh, which we published in 2018, was again a global initiative where we convened a set of um, uh, commissioners from every world region. We had almost representative every single continent on the planet and multiple countries such. And it's leading experts from multiple disciplines, from Mm -hmm. economists to political scientists to medics, um, sociologists. And we did that purposely because we recognized that um, migration is one of the defining issues of our time. Humans have always migrated, right, from the onset of our species to today, and will continue to do so until um, we are extinct on the planet. Consequently, we cannot but um, deal with the issue of migration as a reality of our time if we are to be prepared. Um, What we did in that report is address the usual health system issues um, to say if you are to have a system that responds to migration as a whole, you need to think through in how you design your health system to improve access for migrants to health to uh, ensure that your system is able to cope with um, the needs of migrants uh, in the most effective and efficient way. But we also did something else that was novel, which was we challenged a number of um, essentially incorrect myths about uh, what my, the role migrants play in terms mm-hmm. of consuming resources, in healthcare, in terms of 
um, the number of children that migrants have in terms of their contribution to the economy versus how much resource they use in the health system, because we feel it's important to back those off with data and where information that is being sent out is wrong, that we're able to lay out the facts on the ground that allow people to take sensible decisions. One thing that is certain, and I published um, some, some in, um, a, a paper in The Lancet, I think after the migration report, that was reviewing world population health uh, data, including those uh, some analysis by the Institute of Health Metrics about uh, population trends in the world. And it's clear to everyone that the trajectory of the global population in terms of a workforce that can contribute to the economies uh, as a consequence of aging populations, the health, the, the health workforce and the overall workforce is shrinking in many yep. parts of the world and only in a few regions of the world is it increasing. And the only answer that one can see to this change in, in, the global, in global demography is the movement of people. Now, we have a choice of either doing it right and ensuring that we're able to respond to this change in demography um, and ensure that everybody in the world benefits from this change in dynamics, or we do it wrong and we end up with migration where both migrants and receiving populations get it wrong. And from a health lens, there could be, couldn't be anything... Um, I can't think of a greater tragedy than getting that wrong because it could lead to needless loss of life. It could lead to existing health systems being stretched inappropriately. Um, and so I'm very passionate that health systems everywhere in the world, whether you're a receiving country or a sending country, you think through the consequences of migration and you plan appropriately to respond to um, the, the, the effects of migration. Putting, not putting politics aside, being cognizant of the political issues, but responding to it in such a way that you optimize outcomes for everyone. So. I, I mentioned uh, again in, in the bio of the show, your role previously as a senior investigator in the, uh, the Medical Research Council Clinical Trials Unit. You participated in the recent World Health Organization's uh, first uh, global clinical trials forum uh, back in November. Um, can you say a few words, because this is another area, clearly, you know, the clinical development has been concentrated in, in certain niches over the years. I mean, you, you explored quite a few topics here uh, in terms of, you know, ultimately building a, a more sustainable system uh, that, you know, you sort of find used all the time uh, and, you know, providing utility for, for all populations, um, you know, even addressing underrepresented populations, children, women, uh, pregnant women, so forth, uh, and then also adapting for some of these new uh, therapeutic modalities, whether they're traditional interventions or digital uh, therapeutics and so forth. Uh, could you just give us a little synopsis of what you took away uh, from this recent WHO meeting? Sure. So I was actually delighted when the WHO asked me to co-chair the first global forum on clinical trials, because it is an issue that I've been um, involved in, as you said, from my time at the MRC Clinical Trials Unit, and I continue to run and be principal investigator on major randomized control trials um, in my field of interest, that is TB and other areas, mm -hmm. um, and be, contribute to other people's trials. Um, one observation is that we, on the one hand, our regulatory systems that are um, created to protect us from harm have become way too cumbersome. Uh, when I compare what my colleagues that were working in the 60s and 70s at the MRC unit were doing, where in a few years they could do multiple trials with what happens today. The mm -hmm. phase at which we, we deliver results for people has slowed down immensely. On the other hand, the world is faced with even more threats um, with all of the other difficulties such as pandemics and the emergence of chronic diseases and um, the rising opportunities to make a difference to conditions like cancer. So um, the clinical trial space at the global level needs a little bit of um, a little bit, a massive amount of rethink about how we optimize the systems. And this meeting in Geneva convened a large group of experts from the regulators to the major funders such as NIH and um, the European uh, Commission, mm -hmm. uh, to national governments and regional authorities from every world region, as well as clinical trialists, as well as industry as observers. So the mm -hmm. big pharmaceutical companies and diagnostic manufacturers. It was an amazing congregation of the global clinical trial community. Remarkably, there was um, agreement across the community that A, something needs to be done and there are concrete things that we need to do to prepare for um, the next phase of uh, global health threats, including the next pandemic. And those things include A, 
having a system that means that we move towards larger, robust platform trials. We don't do pointless. We reduce the number of small, pointless trials that don't need um, that don't lead to significant clinical results. And we organize as the big countries can do or big regional arrangements into large platform trials that can evaluate multiple compounds to be more innovative in the way we deliver trials, to simplify the levels of regulation that we have um, while maintaining safety. So making sure that um, new agents are scrutinized sufficiently, but ensuring that paperwork and protocol that um, is unnecessary um, and is slowing down trials are are reduced um, to to levels where trials are more efficient, to um, setting up systems where we think um, a mantra of trials always on. So although you would need to have massive trials during, for example, pandemics, the way Mm -hmm. to do that is to make sure those platforms I described at the beginning, they're operating effectively, addressing your chronic conditions, cancer, cardiovascular disease. And then when a pandemic appears, you have those platforms ready and you just switch them to uh, responding to the new threat of a pandemic infection. So always on was sort of the narrative that we had. Um, Simplified governance, platform trials, and trials that are always on was a summary of that meeting. Yeah, I, I, I very much enjoyed that theme of always on. And as you, the other thing you just touched on, the um, this uh, this trend towards, you know, how we more appropriately study combinations uh, in, in other therapeutic areas. Obviously, we've made amazing strides for things like HIV. And I think there's very interesting uh, strategies there to, to how we look at things like combination first versus waiting decades for to study individual drugs and ultimately putting them together. No, it's, uh, yeah, again, that was a, another really interesting, interesting um forum that you got to to be involved in there and again i was just impressed by by your involvement in, in all these different areas what um what else is is coming up for you in 2024 i, I saw that there's some uh conferences uh, i think later in the year um in terms that you're going to be speaking at anything in the, in the coming months uh as we just entered the new year that we should know about uh in terms of public facing initiatives uh where we can uh listen to you possibly run into you anything else on the calendar that you want to mention uh for the public please uh anything i missed uh, take the floor so, kindly so I, i'm i'm super excited about the next phase of our work in the global preparedness monitoring board as we expand um our role in accountability um using independent monitoring advocating for the world to adopt independent monitoring as a mantra um and then using that to get accountability and there are multiple um, events between now and which you can get a, a, the detail from my colleagues at the GPMB, ultimately leading to our next report. So we are planning for a 2024 report and our time scale towards that would involve that. And we would all be engaged in public facing activity to promote um, uh, using the, the metrics that we've developed, um, how prepared the world is. I hope it will show evidence of progress compared to 2023, fingers crossed, although um, there are many, many global processes on track that may or may not reach maturity by then. I hope they do. Um, I'm excited about some of the work that I am doing in relation to health systems um, mm-hmm. on cancer in particular. Um, and I'm speaking at um, the University of Chicago at their ground rounds um, mm-hmm. in April. And I'm looking forward to that event uh, because we'll be talking about health systems, cancer and inequalities. Um, I'm looking forward to um, continuing engagement with the Nigerian health system as I've joined their National Health Research Committee and more parochially closer to home at University College London, where I'm leading our health strategy and reform towards how we think about the provision of education and research, um, thinking about the next big threats to humanity, uh, both in terms of uh, the thick issues we've been talking about, but the aging of our populations and as well as um, the threats of the next pandemic and a continuation of inequality. So it's fingers crossed, very exciting year coming up. It's a uh, quite a full portfolio. Um, I'm excited for you, and at the same time, you know, wishing you the best with all this because it is such a diverse range of themes, and uh, you know, obviously, all feeding into uh, this picture of public health, global public health. That's just uh, so very important um, for all of us. So, I, I again, um, wishing you the best as you continue this journey. Um, again, for everybody that is going to be listening to. Uh, this particular episode of our show uh, across the various podcast networks, 
or watching on our YouTube channel. Uh, again, you've been spending time with Professor Ibrahim Abubakar, Dean, University of College London, Faculty of Population Health Sciences, Professor of Infectious Disease Epidemiology, and the Global Preparedness uh, Monitoring Board. Um, Professor, I really want to thank you uh, for taking the time out of your schedule today to come talk to us for a little while and expose us to everything you, you're doing, you've been involved in. Really, you know, thank you for doing it. And as we like to say on our show here, you know, thank you for helping to create a better tomorrow for so many people out there via the type of work that you've been doing. Uh, it's a really a great story. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.